Daniel is just one of the finest people that I know. Uh, I shared with you guys last week, he was on staff with us for about a year uh, in 2008, 2009, and it was great to know him then, and it, it's been exciting to follow his career. He stayed in student work for a while, and for the last three years, he's been full-time speaking, and uh, he's got, uh, you know, just a complete ministry of, uh, you know, heck, you've done TV, you've done some specials, and uh, written, written some books which we advertise in the bulletin are available, but they're not. So uh, the publisher, they ran out, which is a good thing, but the publisher didn't uh, reprint them in time because they didn't have any faith. Yeah. But uh, yeah. anyway, <laughs> hey, I want you to listen to my friend and one of my heroes, uh, Daniel Ritchie. Daniel. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. All right, Calvary, how we doing? Good, man. All right, all right. I, I like, I, I like that, uh, that energy, man. That's exactly what we want. But it, I'm incredibly grateful to be here, uh, especially on this Mother's Day weekend. And, and for those of you gentlemen just realizing <laughs> that, that reality right now, there's still hope to save your lives. Uh, so I don't know if Edible Arrangement delivers that fast, um, but you, you better get to work. So, so don't forget to, uh, to reach out to those, in, in those moms, uh, th those wives in your life that, that, uh, that have helped raise either you or your amazing kids, man. Uh, it's just such a great weekend to, to just be thankful for just the grace that God has given us in, uh, in, in the moms and in the, in the women uh, that he has given us in our life. Uh, likewise for me, uh, man, my, my mom, a uh, huge part of my life, my, my wife, who is, who is also here, man, she came to the Arizona sunshine with me, she's the, she's the mother of our, our two awesome kids, we've got a nine-year-old and a five-year-old, and, uh, and so, man, so, so incredibly thankful, hey, hey, he's like, that's me, um, but, uh, but just so incredibly grateful to be here uh, with you guys. And so what I want to do is very briefly, I, I do just want to share some of my story and get the armless elephant out of the middle of the room, uh, because I know like people, people always have questions. People are going to wonder what, uh, what woodland creature robbed me of my arms or, or what vicious shark uh, just had a snack. But, um, but to rid in any of those wanderings, uh, man, this is, just, this is just how God fearfully and wonderfully made me, that even, even while I was still in my mother's womb, uh, that this was his plan from moment one. But the, the wild thing in that, uh, nobody knew that this was what was coming into the world. Uh, my mom had a healthy pregnancy. My mom had two ultrasounds. And so nobody, nobody knew that this was it, literally until the doctors holding me there in the delivery room and in that moment, not, not only am I armless, but I was also lifeless. I, I wasn't breathing, I wasn't moving. The doctor tried to find a pulse, and, and he couldn't find a pulse, and so he just really quickly turned to my dad, and he held me up so dad could see that I didn't have arms, and then he just asked my dad, do you want us to let him go? Because looking at me, you know, uh, my life in a lot of ways doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot of worldly sense. You know, from, from a completely exterior perspective. I mean, think about, think about your day to day. Think about all of the things that you've done from waking up this morning, making breakfast, getting ready, getting dressed, doing your little errands about the day, going out on the lake, going out to eat, all of the things that you've done. Now hit the reset button on your entire day and now do it all, but don't use your fingers, don't use your thumb, your arms, your elbows, nothing. How much of that seems possible? How much of that seems remotely a, a life worth living from the world's point of view? From the world's point of view, my, my life doesn't make sense. But man, I, I thank God that I had two parents in that moment that even though I don't make a whole lot of worldly sense, they're looking at me going, that's our kid. That, that's our boy that God has given us, and so you're going to do whatever it is that you can do to try to bring him back. And so the doctors rushed me out, and they started to work on me. And man, by God's grace, just a couple minutes later, doctor walks in with a little kicking, screaming, armless baby boy, you know, and, and God in his grace, amen. Um, God in his grace had, had brought me back to life. And I think for, for a moment, my parents' fear subsided that worry went away, 
But then what started to happen is word started to creep through the hospital. Hey, there's this little boy up on the third floor and he ain't got no arms, so go check him out. And so, you know, these doctors started to pour into our room. It was pediatricians and orthopedic specialists and, and even guys like neurosurgeons, a, a hand specialist walked into our room and my dad's like, you're barking up the wrong tree, bud. You know, like he, he doesn't have any of those. And, uh, and, and these doctors, they would come in, they would check me out, they would offer all sorts of prognosis, but literally the 15 or 20 doctors that came in our, our room that day, one guy had something positive to say. And the rest of them offered up things like, he'll never feed himself, he'll never write, he won't go to normal school, he won't be a fully functioning independent adult. One doctor pulls my dad out of the room, they have like a heart to heart man conversation and he tells my dad, listen, you should just give him up for adoption because you don't know what you're in for. And again, I think it's just that fear, that worry, that hurt that, in, that invaded my parents' heart, literally in my, my first moment of life, it started to creep its way back in. But then for them, the, the only thing that they held to the only bit of promise and bit of hope that they clung to was, you know what, God brought this kid literally back from the dead. And so God's not going to do that and go, you know what, just figure the rest out, you got this. They, they clung to the fact, you know, if, if God is at work, God is not going to stop with just bringing him to life. And, and, and guys, that's so incredibly true. Like, you know, the way God designed me, yes, it was not with arms. He made y'all people the deluxe models. You know, y'all, you got, you got arms and fingers and all the cool stuff. I'm, I'm the economy model, you know? Like, I didn't, I didn't get the fun stuff. I'm just aerodynamic. Like, that's, that's the only thing I got. But God knew. God knew what I needed. God knew that two feet were gonna be enough and it was as if he wrote that on my heart literally from moment one. And nobody had to teach me how to stick a spoon in between my toes and make chocolate chip cookie dough vanish into my mouth. Uh, nobody had to teach me how to stick a crayon in between my toes and color in between the lines and, and write my ABCs. It was just as if, man, God gave me what I needed. And all of those things I was never supposed to do, God took the opinions of man. He said, hey, watch this. And man, by God's grace, I went to a normal school. By God's grace, you know, I, I grew up doing all the things that, that all of the kids my age did. My dad taught me how to fish. Probably about eight years old, my dad looked me right in the eye and he's like, now listen, we can't have an unarmed, unarmed man in the house because that's a double <laughs> negative. And, uh, and so dad taught me how to shoot. Dad taught me how to hunt. Dad, um, you know, dad taught me how to drive tractors and lawnmowers and go-karts. Uh, you know, I got a license at 16, just like every other high school boy did. Graduated high school with honors, went to college on a full ride. I uh, met my wife, Heather, there in college. We, we have two awesome kids, and, and these days I, I have a ministry that I'm just daily blown away with, with what God is doing. And, and all of that, amen. And, and, and all of that in view of a kid that the world said he doesn't deserve to take another breath. He doesn't need to be here. He doesn't have a life that's worth living. And that right there is my struggle. Because that, that belief of the world started to become my belief as I grew up. Was it, man, what's good about this? You know, the, the wind blows too hard, and I look like one of those floppy things outside the used car dealership, you know? Like, there's, there's, not, there, there's not a whole lot good about this God. There, there's nothing glorious that when I go out with my family to eat that everybody stops and stares. There's nothing glorious that, that when I go to Walmart to, to pick up a couple last minute things before I come home that, that people are trying to slip in low key iPhone camera photos of me just trying to live everyday life. And so in my heart, I started to keep score of my life and God's love and God's grace toward me the way the world keeps score. And so I'm sitting here going, well, God, I know 
You know, I, I've, I've heard over and over, yeah, Jesus loves me, but I look around and I, and I think, why doesn't Jesus love me just the same way that he loves everybody else? Why did Jesus love them and give them arms? Why doesn't Jesus love me and give me arms just like them? And for the longest time, I, I, grew, I grew resentful and bitter and, and spiteful, not only toward other people, but to myself, toward God. And man, that all changed. As a, as a 15 year old boy, when I saw God's love for me, not only in the fact that he fearfully and wonderfully made me this way, that I'm not some sort of accident, I'm not some sort of oops, there is nothing that escapes the sovereign hand of God. There is nothing that we encounter in this life that God goes, man, we can't come back from that. God knew. God made me this way, designed me this way for a reason. But not only that, God shows his love for me in this, in that while I was still a sinner and while I completely resented and hated him, he sends his son to this earth to live the perfect life I couldn't live, to die the death that I most certainly should die, so that for those of us who trust in and rest in Jesus as Savior and Lord, we are adopted into the family of God and we are sent out on the mission of God. That's the picture of God's love for you and for me. And man, to trust in and to rest in that hope, that gospel, that truth changed my life. And to watch how God radically started to grow me and to, to make me more dependent on him and not just like my own will, my own two strong legs, but to realize that my life, my hope, my strength, my everything comes from the creator and the sustainer of the universe changed everything about me. And I think as you, know, as you guys have been going through a study in the book of Philippians, man, that, that verse at the very end, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ that gives me the strength. That became such a huge verse for me. But man, as I started to study the whole of scripture, the whole of, of this book in, in, in Philippians, man, there's a verse in what we're gonna read tonight that, that truthfully changed my life. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, we're gonna look in Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter one, we're gonna read verses 19 through 26. And, and again, like to, to double back on, on some of you, you know, in, in what you've been learning through, through this series, Paul pens the book of Philippians, he's in prison. Paul's been sentenced to prison and he doesn't know if he's gonna live or die. And honestly, we see this, this own battle that Paul's having in his own heart, not knowing if he's gonna see tomorrow or not. But in the midst of all of this, in the midst of like this affliction and trial and persecution, the apostle pens what a lot of theologians are gonna describe as the book of joy. And, to, and so some of us tonight some of us tonight, as we look at our lives, as we look at, at, at just the landscape of what's going on, we go, God, how can I have hope? How can I have that same joy that Paul rests in and hopes in? And honestly, we see the glimmer of it in what we're about to read, and we see threads of it all through this book of Philippians. And so read with me, Philippians chapter one, starting in verse 19. And it says this, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live on in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let me pray for us real quick as we dive into the word. God, I just pray in these next few moments as we look at your word, as we look at your hope and gospel, that Father, we would know that, that that is a hope that is worth basing our lives on. God, I just simply pray that we would be willing to go all in with all courage, with all hope, 
and with all purpose as we move forward from here. Father, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we look at this text, there's three things I want us to see tonight. And and truthfully, it's it's less about us and and more about Christ. And just three things that we see Jesus working in, in the midst of this, not only for Paul, but for those of us who trust in and rest in Christ as our Lord and everything. The first thing is this, is that Jesus gives us courage Jesus gives us courage. You see in verse 19, Paul has, it, has this just unwavering faith that he says, listen, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit that I will get through this. Paul realizes all through this book itself that, that God will be his supply. God will be his strength. God will be his everything. He bookends this, this, um, this epistle to the Philippian church. And he says in verse 19 of Philippians chapter 4, he says, I know then my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Paul just lays it all out there, knowing and understanding that I, it is my true hope that when it's all said and done, that Christ would be honored in me, whether in life or in death. And Paul's prayer is just that God would give him the strength and the courage to do that in whatever he has to face. And that for us, that's, that's an incredibly difficult motto and way of life to embrace. That God, whatever I have to face in this life, I pray that I honor you. I pray that I give you the credit. I pray that I trust you. I pray that I'll go where you tell me to go. I mean, it is the ultimate putting your yes on the table before God, and that, that's an incredibly scary thing to know that I will trust God and his call and his strength no matter what I have to face. And in my own life, you know, there have been so many times where I've been dependent on God. God, can you just help me get through this day? God, can you just help me figure out how to, how to write with my feet or how to type with my feet? But man, later on in life, as God not only saves me, God calls me into ministry as a 16-year-old boy, and I'm sitting here going, Lord, I I hate human beings. Like, I have have no desire to, to, to spend time with crowds of humans, and yet you're calling me to go and take the gospel to them. But as a 16-year-old boy, I was like, all right, God, I'll try. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best, I'll, I'll put my yes on the table. And from that moment forward to watch how God took that yes and called me to more and more uncomfortable things, more things that, that I am the least person in the world to be qualified to. You know, God will put you in places and in opportunities that it doesn't feel like you're the, you're the man or you're the woman for the job. Doesn't feel like you have anything that you can bring to the table, nothing redeemable. God, who am I? But honestly, who we are are people that are trusting an almighty God. That's, that's where, where we need to take a step back and have the courage and the strength to say, I'm not it. I'm not the most important person in the room or the most strong person in the room. I'm trusting in and resting in and hoping in the one who is the source of strength and of hope and of, and of truthfully everything. You know, I, I've spent my life telling people, you know, you can get through this. You can do this. You, you can embrace whatever God has in front of you. And over and over, God, God fi- has me being stretched when it comes to that. You know, a few years ago, I, um, I, I was sitting on the back porch of our house. I was, I was sipping on some iced coffee, and, um, and you know, I was, just, I was just enjoying the afternoon in the sun, not quite like the Arizona sun, but, uh, you know, just, uh, just having a good afternoon, and a push notification came across my phone. I didn't have anything else to do, so I just, you know, I tapped on it. And lo and behold, in, in this news article, it, it was starting to lay out this uh, abortion legislation that was going through um, the state of Virginia. And in this legislation, they were offering up protections to abort kids with disabilities all the way up until the point of birth. And even as the governor of Virginia described in this interview, he was offering up protections that a child could be born, especially a kid with a disability, and he could be kept comfortable 
and a conversation could ensue between the doctor and the mother as to whether the baby should live or die. And I'm reading this article, and I'm playing out this, this conversation, this scenario in my mind, and I'm going, that's the conversation that was held over my lifeless body. That was the conversation that was held over my body that, that men with professional opinions and, and lengthy degrees are looking at my life going, he'll never be this, he'll never be independent, he'll never be an adult, why bother? How many mothers are gonna be told, why bother? What's this kid gonna be? And so I, you know, I read that article and I'm just, I'm just floored and I was like, I, I've gotta, I've gotta do, do something. And so in that moment, I did what every millennial would do. I, I took a video on my phone and I posted it to Twitter, uh, you know, and, and just, uh, man, in that, it, it was probably about 90 seconds, I just laid out just biblically why this is jacked up and why kids like me, why we truthfully have purpose and why our lives have meaning and that we can bring something to this world that very few can offer. And man, it was, amen. Um, it was, it was wild how in just a matter of hours, man, this, it, it gained some social media traction. And, it, and in just about four hours, it had 10,000 views on Twitter and all these retweets and likes and so much so that somebody reached out uh, to me from Fox News. And they were like, hey, man, we really like that article um, or we really like that video. Could you take that and could you turn it into like an 800-word article? Just write it for us and we're going to post it on our website tomorrow. And I'm sitting here going... Ah, uh, you know, that's, that's not my wheelhouse. Like, I'm not an overly political guy. I'm sitting here going, I, I don't have a master's degree. I don't, I don't, I'm not an ethicist. I don't, I don't teach in, in some sort of college. All I've got is just the reality that, that my hope and my everything is tied up in the person and the work of Christ. So if you're cool with me preaching, that's all I got. And they're like, okay, we're cool with you preaching. And, uh, it's like, you're lost. And so, you know, I typed it up, and I, I sent it to them. And, uh, and the next day, they, they, they posted it on their website. And, and of all the things that Apple News picked up as their push notification for that day, it was, it was that article talking about the, the value of human life and the design and the care of God toward all human beings. And, and, in, and in 24 hours, 4 million people had read through this article. And... And so, and so Fox, Fox News, they like doubled down. They were like, hey, bro, um, can, uh, can, can you be in New York City in like 12 hours? And uh, I'm like, I, again, all I got is this whole Jesus thing. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not like overly authoritative or political, but I can talk about Christ and what he's done and the purpose and the hope that he's given me if, if you're cool with that, that's all I bring to the table. And they're like, that's fine, let's do it. It's like, all right, that's fine, let's do it. And, uh, and so I said yes, and I hung up the phone. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, like this is, this is the worst decision I've ever made. Like I'm gonna look like full redneck on national TV. <laughs> And, uh, and so, you know, I'm on the plane and I, I fly up there and I'm, I'm honestly, I'm scared to death and I call my best friend and I'm like, hey bro, what'd I get myself into? You know, like I'm, I'm not cut out for this. And I called the wrong human being because the only thing he told me was, listen, you screw up, seven million people think you're a moron. And <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you so much. And, you know, click, hang up. And, um, and so I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, I, I don't know what to do. And, you know, in, in all of these shows, everything's scripted. Like the, the guests coming on, we know everything they're going to ask us, and they know everything we're going to say. And so I'm just playing through uh, the script in my mind over and over and over and pull up to Fox News headquarters and get out of the car and, uh, and I walk into the green room, and there's only three human beings in this green room uh, for this show, and it's me, and it's Representative, or Congressman Doug Collins, and then former Governor Chris Christie. And so I'm going, I'm the dumbest person in the room, uh, you know? And, and so it's just like, my, 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 my nerves spiked, I, I, I was just scared. 
And I just remember I sat there real quiet. The, sh the show went through the motions and they finally called me up there and we went through the, the first three questions straight according to script. And then the fourth question, she threw me a curveball and she asked me, listen, something happened when you were 15 years old that changed your life. What was it? And I'm sitting here, you know, I'm, I'm here to talk about like pro-life and abortion and I'm going, I didn't do nothing as a 15 year old to do, to do with any of that. And then I realized in, in just a split second, this woman wants me to talk about the day I trusted in, rested in Jesus as my savior, my Lord, my everything. And for 45 seconds, I got to share the gospel of God's grace with, with truthfully, with, with more people, it's like I could preach for 50 more years in person and I won't preach to 7 million people. But in those 45 seconds I did. And those, those 45 seconds happened because I put my yes on the table. To go, God, I'm not cut out for this. God, I'm not the smartest person in the room. God, I'm not the most talented. But God, I know who you are. And I know that you're the one I trust, and God, I just pray that even at the worst of me, the weakest of me, that God, ultimately, you would even give me the strength to trust you. And that's the beautiful part about the God that we trust, is he is the one that gives us the courage and the strength to even keep pursuing him in the first place. And how many times do, does life fall apart? How many times do we bump up against things that we feel just desperately unqualified for and we think all I've gotta do is just grind my way through it when God is saying, can't you just trust me? Can't you just stop fighting and, and rest on me and depend on me? And much in the same way, we see the Apostle Paul right here, the guy that pens half of the New Testament, the guy that raises up the New Testament church, and he says, you know what, the only way I get out of this is by the grace of God. The only way I endure this is by his work and by your prayers. Church, may we realize that our courage and strength to even run come by his grace and the strength that he supplies. Second thing I want us to see uh, is this, that Jesus is the one who gives us life. Just as much as Jesus is the one who gives us courage, Jesus is the one who gives us life. He says in verse 21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And now, you know, that's, that's the most annoying person in the world to persecute, you know, because for him... For him, his, his contentment, his hope, his everything is tied up in the person and the work of Christ. So it's like, you can take his freedom. He don't care. He still has Jesus. You can take his health. He don't care. He still has Jesus. And you know what you do if you kill him? You introduce him to Jesus. So it's like, <laughs> that there is nothing, there's nothing that you can do to shake this guy up. He has built his entire life on Christ and he knows that the moment he passes from this life to the next, he gets to see the one that he's lived his whole life for in the first place. That's a really dangerous person, but dangerous in all of the right ways. And for us who trust in and rest in Christ, not only as our like get out of hell free card, as we trust in and rest in him as savior, but also as we trust in and rest in him as our Lord, as our king, as our hope, as our everything, we have the one thing that the world wants, unshakable, everlasting hope. And this world lives for chasing after dollars in the bank account, chasing platform and power and fame, and all of the right you know, possessions and tools and cool things, but you know what happens is all of those things fade. All of those things blow up, all of those things go away. But what we have in Christ, it does not fade. It does not go away, he is our life. That's why Jesus says in John 10, I've come to give you life and life more abundant. But it's also the reminder, the enemy comes to still kill and destroy. The enemy has raised up a world that chases after things that fail and fall away. What we have in Christ remains. What we have in Christ does not fade. What we have in Christ is worth building our lives on. And some of us tonight, some of us in here, 
we've chased after and we've built our lives on the wrong things, on things that fail, on things that disappoint, on things that rust and rip apart. But what we have in Christ is something that cannot be robbed from us, that even if we should pass from this life to the next, then praise God, I get to see the one who rescued and redeemed me. And then the last thing I want us to see is this, Jesus gives us purpose. So Jesus gives us courage, Jesus gives us life, and Jesus gives us purpose. You know, you see this inner debate that Paul's going through, and he says, I don't know if I want to go see Jesus or if I want to remain, but why does he say he wants to remain? He says, it's for you. I want to continue on in this life because I want to continue to pour the gospel of God's grace into you that it's the best thing for the world that I don't die, but that I press on. Now the sobering question comes for us to ask of ourselves, is that true of you? Is it better for this world? Is it better for this kingdom of God that I live another day, that I have another opportunity to love and share and serve all in Jesus' name, all for his glory, all in spite of my mess and my insecurity and my circumstances. Because sometimes we look at this shell of a body and we go, God, what's good about this? God, what can you use about me and the skeletons in my closet, my sinful past and all my weaknesses? God, what can you do about this? For years when I asked God, why no arms? (laughs) It's not glorious, it's not good. But I can't tell you how many times I have conversations with people at the grocery store and at the gas station, out to eat with my family, because they see an armless person, they see me like that doctor saw me in the delivery room, and they go, why bother? They go, what's the point? But then they look at me and they go, why is he not miserable? Why is is he happy? And in the world's eyes, there's an incongruency in there that has to be fixed, and so they're like, hey man, what happened? Hey, how'd you get here? And in that moment, I get to tell them about the savior and sustainer of the world who changed my life by the gospel of his grace. All of that, all of that because I have two floppy sleeves. Now listen, most of you don't have floppy sleeves. I recognize that. But most of you have gifts and talents and abilities I don't have. You have relationships that I will will never make. You have a circle of influence and people to love that that I will never have the opportunity to love. God has placed you in your shoes around your people with your gifts for a reason. He has given you this life to go and to tell the world, man, look at what my creator and my savior has done in this life. That's your one purpose. If you're a mechanic, man, be a mechanic to the glory of God. If you're a mom or dad, be a mom or a dad to the glory of God. If you're a retiree, then man, play golf to the glory of God. I don't, you know, we, we have so many opportunities and relationships and people to be around, but are we leveraging that for his purpose? Are we using it for ours? Because it's the one reason why God has placed you on this earth to not make excuses, to not back away, to not waffle, but to trust in, rest in, and talk like Jesus is king. Wherever you are today, know that your life is not too messed up for the grace of God. Your weaknesses are not too big for his strength. He's got you. And all he is imploring you to do is to trust him with all of it. Trust him with the church services, trust him with with every bit of who you are, all for his glory, all for his purposes, and all for his good. And when you trust him with that, just watch how you become a person that the world is thankful that you see another day, just like we see here with Paul. Be a person who changes the world all in his name. Let me pray for us. God. Thank you so much for every person in this room. 
God, every man and woman that you have made, God, that you desire to rescue and redeem, God, for your church that you are calling out into the world to love like you matter, God, to live like you matter, and God, ultimately, I pray that as we leave this place today that that would be true of us. God, that we would be people who don't make excuses, that we would just be people who simply love and serve all in your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.